Hey everyone, thank you for coming back to our series. Hey Lucas, how are you today? Good, good morning, good to see you again. Yep. <laughs> As I see you, I can't help but notice you've got a little bit of a, a, a nick there and it can't be a shaving cut because that's a little bit high up for a, for a shaving cut. I mean, I, I don't even have, I hardly have facial hair, but uh, yeah, I have a beauty <laughs> mark accident. Uh, let's leave it at that. But uh, yeah, Ooh. any recommendation, please feel free to drop a comment. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I was um, revisiting some of the notes that I had in the past. And uh, one of the funny thing about the, the early 2000s, um, well, apart from the the pans and the and the frosted highlights and everything that let's not go into uh, is that <laughs> there's a bit of a mentality of cutting out the middleman uh, for small businesses and um, it, it's very interesting looking back at it now because at that point in time it was the the gospel that the, the the ultimate things that people think that okay we should do that cut out the middleman um, yeah. but what I, just kind of like. Well, I mean, now we know that, you know, with the online space, with the digital transformation in our world, that even customers that are looking at ways to, you know, find ways to get things done and they can compare a lot easier. It's so interesting that you say that because I've, I've been thinking about that in, in depth and I do have a good, a good uh, thought process around that. There's some middlemen that I completely disagree with, and let's keep it on keep it on digital transformation, right? There's a lot of digital marketing companies out there that what they want you to do is to come to them when you've found product market fit, all of your communications are ready, you've identified the job to be done, you know your segmentation, and you basically hand them your content and a blueprint. What they will then do is go and organize pay per clicks. They'll organize your SEO and they might create a landing page. But the person that you're dealing with in Australia isn't the one that does the work. They go and outsource it straight away. Now, that I'm very critical of because that oh, I'm saying, well, you could do it yourself, right? And yeah. you're getting, you're just paying a premium. What they're really doing is putting another layer on top of freelancer, right? Yep. That sucks. <laughs> Where the value is, is in what you and I do, where it's like, you know, this, you're not ready. This isn't good enough. Let's talk about the market. Let's identify the job to be done. Let's see if we can communicate your value proposition. That's where the value is, is getting to the, to the stage where it's, where it's ready. And that it, makes me feel a little bit upset, actually, because <laughs> it happens a lot. Digital marketing speciality of the marketer area. And it yeah. is, um, they are operational. They focus on the operational side of how to get the ads done. Uh, I have a really interesting conversation with someone in digital marketing before is that uh, he regarded an ad as working because it's operational, yeah. it's up and running, people can see it. But yep. then I don't see it as working because it's not targeting the right people. It's not, it's, it's, you're yeah. really just, you're just like you said, like, you know, just yeah. receiving a package of information and then just click, click, click and get it done. Oh. And, no, like um, no shade to digital marketers, like they are important in uh, and they deal with this complication of changing environment. And I I, sure. I respect that, but yeah, like like you know, like you said before, I I don't do it. I'm a content marketer. I think about like you know what are customers looking for? Like the customers yes. maybe consumers or businesses, but like they look for yeah. different things. Every business yeah. is different. Most of them will work on a commission where they'll take 20% of the increase in revenue that they create for you. So it's in their interest to pick off the low hanging fruit and get quick sales. What that does to your brand and your product is another story long term, right? Like, you know, like, like another thing that we're talking about, like, you know, it's, it's about um, the customer's perception and how you are doing what you're doing to perform in it. And have you look at what the customers need. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I guess that's I guess that's where we're going today, isn't it? Customer applications. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I mean, um, I want to mm. share a quick story. It's kind of not so related, but I was um, I was working in this um, art competition quite a few years ago. But it was so interesting. They were celebrating their 60th birthday, which is fantastic, wonderful, good for them. 
Um, but then I realized that their narrative, the perception that they set up was really self-congratulating, but then they oh, kind of forgotten that, that, you know, I mean, I think if I am them, I would focus on, you know, the because they are membership organization that like the, the art competition yeah. is the central, like the, the focal point of it each year. But the key thing is actually their membership program that getting people in it. So if I'm them, like, you know, if I, if I was the decision maker back then, then I would have been the person who was like, well, why don't we share um, previous members' stories, like some heartwarming story mm. or something like that, mm. because you are building perception of who you are, of meeting what your customers, in their case, their members need, of that sense of if you make community, but instead of just keep saying that, I'm congratulating myself for being around for 60 years. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those organizations, they they invent awards to award to themselves. I've seen CSIRO do it. It's it's unbelievable. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I mean, each other on the way. <laughs> well, I mean, I want to be a, I want to I want the award of the best bullshitter. Yeah, oh well, I'll, I'll I'll make one up for you. Let's let's unfortunately we can't use the taxpayer money like the CSIRO in those governments. Well, all right. Well, okay. Well, I'll I'll design my own trophy for that. But yeah. <laughs> but I, I think most of our most of our clients I'm making a presumption, uh, but then I would imagine most of our clients don't have that luxury to um, spending too much resources to congratulate ourselves, isn't it? Exactly. Now, Lucas, you know me that I have an opinion for everything that I will just keep talking about that forever and ever and ever and ever. So, uh, so I guess what what let's go back to the, the the nice color wheel that we're showing at the beginning of oh. every single episode. Uh, now, this is the interesting one: customer application. What's your thoughts about that? Yeah, excellent. So, in episode one, we looked at we looked at customer base. And we looked at enhancing and transforming in our customer base. Then we went across to product design. Remember, we connect your marketing and technological functions. Yeah. Now we're back to customer applications. So customer applications builds on both customer base and product design. And we're talking about, really, we're talking about where does your product apply in markets other than your core markets? And it's interesting that we look at, firstly, how does your product help the customers overcome their struggles? And again, get the job done faster, and more accurately, because it's the struggle in that job step that causes the customer to look for and purchase a solution. So we know that outside of the industries, industries is a, a terrible way to analyze. Thinking outside of your industry, there's customers struggling with problems where our products might apply. So really, that's what we're looking at. Firstly, the enhancing side is to look within our current customer applications or market applications and check back with the unmet needs and see where we can improve. But the enhancing innovation is the great one. That's where we're creating a new set of applications or finding applications for our technologies outside of our core business. And there's a lot of opportunities that we can talk about um, transforming customer or market applications. Absolutely. I think one of the big questions is that there is a journey, a customer has their journey. Because one of the things I, uh, I'm keen to ask any of the SME that we, we, we're working with is like, do you understand the entire process of uh, like, you know, the purchase and the consumption, like the, the process of why you yeah. get it, what you get in, things like that, you know? Yeah, yeah that's, that's critical, isn't it? So three, three main job types. So there's the core functional job that the customer is trying to get done. And one of the famous examples is um, we, we're, tr we're driving, we've got an appointment, it might be a date, it might be a job interview, and we want to know how to find the fastest route or route available to get yeah. to our appointment on time. So that's a good way to define a job because it's independent of any technology or solution. It doesn't say we're looking for a better map to get here on time. If we were talking about the market by maps, we know that nobody uses the Melways anymore, right? But 20 years ago, um, I think it was 20 years ago, we would use the Melways in our car to find out how to get from A to B on time. And so that's they, an example. <laughs> and your building is always between two pages. Yeah, that's right. Oh, God, I was never good at reading the maps, so I'm glad oh, I'm in good. today's day and age. 
<laughs> oh gosh, actually, I'm so glad that I'm not on those book map at the moment because I'm I I because I'm in the process of looking for a new place to move. And then I was like, after after I was in city, just go on the app and enter the address and go for it. I would just imagine if I have that that just kind of like need to flip the page and figure it out and then figure out what train or bus or trams that I do because you know a bit I'm, I'm I get too nervous on the road, especially on a on a wet day. So I was a little bit like, "Yep, isn't it good that things are different now?" <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh absolutely. my god! And and interesting that is, um, you know, uh, remember in the earlier episode that we talked about all the uh, multiple numbers of toothpaste or razors and things like that. People just change the flavor a little bit or change the charging port yeah. a little bit and sell it as a new product. But I mean, it, it's actually, it, it, it warrants a new question that we should ask, like, you know, we should ask our client. It's like, have you reassessed what the needs are? Like, you know, after you have a product out there, there are things that are a little bit more than, you know, after a little while, things do go obsolete. I mean, have you seen yeah. Toys R Us? I mean, we all grow out yeah. of that phase and then all of that thing, you know, sometimes we do need to transform. Yep. Yeah, okay. So yeah, that's exactly right. So if we look back at customer applications, so companies, whether they're talking, let's talk about a manufacturer. So a manufacturer has got a physical, tangible product. So firstly, you're thinking, well, I might be selling this into medical device manufacturing. Um, I'm competing in that industry. An industry is a group of sellers, a market's a group of buyers. Then you're thinking, well, what about defense? What about space? So what we advise companies to do is to not look at the product is to look at the bundle of capabilities that makes up this product. So within this, you've got capital equipment that you use to produce the product. You've got your technical skill sets. You've got your supplier relations. So any of these capabilities you can leverage into new markets. And a good example, again, is, is Dyson's vacuum cleaner. Dyson's vacuum cleaners never competed in the medical device manufacturing industry. As soon as COVID hit, Dyson's was very quick to do this. They were saying, well, we got a vacuum cleaner. This is comprised of this, this, and this. How does this part apply into ventilators? Because COVID's in big need of ventilators. They did that and applied their engine, vacuum clean engine, into ventilators in medical device pharmaceutical industry in about six weeks. It was incredible. They just, they just vacuum up the market. Absolutely. I mean... Think about how many untapped opportunities we have in Australia to do that, that we're not advising companies to do. <laughs> it, it, in the past year, that it was so interesting on the news. Well, I was trying to look for things that are not COVID last year, like on the news. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, and one of the interesting things is about solar energy, solar panel and the microgrid of how the sure. energy being we sold back to the market and at the moment, there's a big story about, well, I mean, hey, uh, people are not getting getting paid for what they got or they thought that when they install this, this, this will yeah. be, this will, you know, that kind of like, they will save money, but they actually cost them more. But the ultimate question of that, I was looking into that a little bit deeper. Some part, one part of it is because there was a client, uh, <laughs> but you know, yeah, sure. pay me a child doing costumes. But I mean, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, the yeah. other part of it, but one interesting part that was hardly covered by the news was that there isn't a useful energy storing device, the electricity storage device that yep. people can keep the energy in their home so they can have a choice of use it or sell it to the market, to the microgrid if should they want to. And that's actually the thing that would barely cover on the news because they usually just say that electricity company have that power yeah. to control that. But then that's, I, I, that is a part of the transformation of like, you know, using what you got, but then use it differently. Yeah, absolutely. So you've identified one of the, the growth priority areas. So it's interesting and it's another topic. A federal government won't pick winners as in, when, you're, when you go for a grant or anything, they're not going to choose or evaluate you to see how strong your, your offering is. They don't care. What they do pick is winners in sectors or industries. So recycling and clean energy is one of the six 
that have been identified. First, they were identified in 2014, and it was late October last year. This is where the government puts all of their money because we think that our future will be secured and our competitiveness with these industries. And you and I have touched on food and beverage. Then you just introduced recycling and clean energy. Of course, medical products, medical devices, and pharmaceutical, that's expedited now. Defence, believe it or not, we're oh. putting a lot in space. Well, <laughs> and have resources. you seen the news? No, I haven't. No. Of course, they all... Oh, I'll send it to you later. I'll cut this bit out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, Defense, I saw a yeah. funny meme. Somebody said, I'm, I'm dissatisfied with my job here in Australia. And, and Elon Musk says, come to Mars. And then you see that they're in Mars doing the same job. So... Well, I don't know. Investing into space, I'll leave that for other people to, to decide whether that should be our priority. That, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I know that I'm excited about the develop the frontier of space, but I'm, but um, do I want to go there? I mean, space tourism, would I? I mean, I, I, I would love to leave the country, but not leave the atmosphere. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, regardless actually, of what it, yeah, it's, it's actually, created it's the, so many opportunities for manufacturers here, though, space, true, that's for sure. True. But hey, I mean, it's a little bit like Australia is somewhat joining the space race a little bit. Uh, maybe we can pull a Bradbury. Fair enough. I well, mean, you look, we didn't even have a radio barely, you know, compared to a spaceship. But it's because there were so many suppliers leveraging what they knew and providing their core capability into that finished product. That's how we got the job done. It may so be that from a vacuum again, cleaner. Or it exactly. may be from a solar battery, whatever. Exactly. But we don't know so, if we don't give it a go. So if SMEs are out there, SMBs are out there listening now, it's to think, well, it's, it can be problematic looking at the competitor too closely and it can be problematic listening to the customer too closely. And that's a strange thing to say, but that's true. So what they need to think is, well, maybe I'll do a patent search. Maybe I'll look at trade shows. Let's go and see what other technologies are doing or what other technologies exist in other industries and, and whether my products can be adjusted to substitute and do that job better. And that should be something that, that gets attention. It is, um, I think in this particular discussion about uh, customers application is that if we're looking at enhancing, we'll look very closely, but then when it comes to transforming, let's yeah, not get exactly. too close because it yeah. just, once you look a little bit too close, it's a little bit like, well, I have that problem. I'm a content marketer. Sometimes when I write something, when I'm preparing a narrative and something like that, I do actually put it aside, go to bed, come back next morning or get a friend to have a look or something like yeah. that. But of course, not client stuff like, you know, that, that kind of thing. Because if I look too close at things and I'm sure that everyone does or at least 90% of the population is yeah. a little bit, when we're too close to something, we don't notice bips and bobs that yep. we don't know and then all gaps out there and that's yep. where on a like for example a product or service development that we can actually step a little bit away from being too close to it and just look at it as a, ah maybe this component of what i do can become something else yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's really interesting maintaining that balance of keeping your current prospective customer base happy usually that's with incremental improvements you know the extra razor on the blade but then on the other hand keeping that open mind to transform and going well what else is out there right because we don't want to be restricted by just focusing on our industry the old ways of analyzing industries are just I, i've done it in the past as a strategy consultant and it's where you you basically look at all your features and functionalities and then you look at the competitors you see where you have features and functionalities they don't and then you call that your point of differentiation and you market that that's it's not an effective way to um, compete. Yeah, it, it, it's well, I mean, it, it used to be a good idea, but I think yep. right now people have way yep. too many choices, way much more choices available. We have to so, be much more flexible now. Insurers are interesting though. They actually, they actually look at, they can actually calculate the probability of you living to a certain age. That's how, how much they're elder. They use what's called actuarial modeling, which means they go back in past history with a, pile of key factors and then they use those weighted key factors 
to determine your life expectancy. And they're actually pretty bloody good at it. <laughs> so Ooh, we I probably, hopefully we, we fall out. We, we might be anomalies. I hope that this is a great story that for people to just filtering out when they reconsider that, okay, I'm going to develop something new with my customers, which angle we're going for, maybe enhancing, maybe transforming, but it's always good to yeah. just uh, talk to someone professional about that. No. So obviously they can set up a project with you uh, or yeah. they can, and they can also come to me for content marketing stuff. Now, um, just to close out the video, um, Lucas, how can people find you on the vast internet space? Yeah, at the moment, I'm, at the moment, because I've got busy with the coaching side of the business, I'm going to be launching a, a training platform and a knowledge base. So you can contact me through the website. You might come up against a landing page. The way to contact me directly is just go straight through LinkedIn or alternatively email lucas at newledge.io, which we'll leave in the, in the footer. That's exciting. And hey, don't forget to um, comment or interact and all the information and the contact detail are underneath this video. What's the next episode? You mentioned it briefly, customer value and knowledge, and that's where we will go next. So we'll talk about customer experience and the customer journey and, and all of those factors that you're, you're quite familiar with. So that's next.